Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to hearing 23, I think we're up to, um, in re relation to Rangatahi. Just by way of um, a bit of sort of etiquette, if you're not speaking, could you please mute your microphone? Um, that way we don't get feedback through the, um, through the system. Thank you. We'll, we'll do a, a round of introductions in a, in a minute. It's a pretty small group today, so we'll keep this reasonably informal and, and sort of get to the heart of things as quickly as we, as we can. Um, the, the one issue that we would wish to stress is that we have read um, all the evidence, submissions, rebuttal statements, um, rebuttal 42A reports, et cetera. Um, so we're really looking for highlights, packages, and focusing on issues that are in dispute rather than um, a, a whole lot of boilerplate stuff that, that's not particularly relevant given that we have read it all, and, and especially given the high degree of agreement that there is between the Rangatahi folk and and um, Ms. Trenauf. Um, we're fairly old hands at these um, Zoom hearings, so we're pretty enamored with how they work. And the only rule really is the one of don't speak while someone else is speaking and please keep your um, microphone off as we've mentioned before, unless you're actually actually talking. What we thought might be a useful starting point before we actually hear um, from the, the 42A report author and then Rangatahi is just because a lot of the evidence is geographically specific and there's reference in the summaries to um, you know, the different um, development areas and the, the temporary, or the sorry, the secondary road access and reference to road names and so forth. If it was feasible, if it could be just a, um, someone could share their screen and just it might be, might be Mr. Inga might be the best per place person to do that, but we don't mind and just give everybody a bit of a geography lesson just to refresh everyone's memory. Is that, does that sound a sensible starting point? And, but we'll do some introductions before we do that. But are you able to do that for us, Mr. Inger, after we've done the, the introductions? Yeah, morning, Dr. Mitchell. Um, I'm happy to do that. Uh, if, we, if I can take a few minutes to get ready while, uh, while we're doing the introductions, that'll be good. That'll be fine. We'll, we'll introduce ourselves slowly and speak slowly. Um, Phil Mitchell's my name. I think everyone here knows me or most people know me. As per our uh, register of interests, I chaired the original plan change hearing for this development. Um, I declared that at the, at, the, um, at the outset. No one had any objections to me hearing it again this time around, but I just wanted for the record to, um, to mention that. Um, so if we could just have the rest of the panel introduce themselves and then the, the, the various other parties, please, and don't stand on formality. We don't, um, we don't need to get too formal about it. Well, Morning, Nakoto. Well, Marg, Independent Commissioner. Good morning. I'm Diane Swarton. I'm an Independent Commissioner and former Waikato District Councillor. I'm Jan Sedgwick. I'm an Independent Commissioner and I'm based in the Waikato. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Paul Cooney is my name, a Deputy Chair and Independent Commissioner. Thank you. Morning, everyone. I'm Sandra Kelly, Senior Project Administrator. Morning, everyone. I'm Suki Singh. I'm a consultant partner to the panel. Tenakoto, um, my name is Chloe Trunau from the 42A reporting planner. Morena, I'm Carolyn Red, assisting council as in the capacity of planning. Yeah. Uh, good morning, I'm Brianna Parkinson. I'm appearing um, as council for Rangatahi Limited. Morning, Ms. Parkinson. Morning, uh, Ben Inga, I'm planner for Rangatahi Limited. You've had a change of stables since we last saw you too, I think. That's You've, right, um, yeah, in the past couple formed, of weeks. <laughs> formed, formed your own firm, well, congratulations on that. Thank you. Good morning all, I'm Ian Clark, I'm a transport planner, assisting Rangatahi today. 
Thanks, Mr. Clark. All right. Um, do you want me to just go ahead, Dr. Mitchell, and share my well, are you, screen? Are you happy to? I mean, I think yeah. I think that would help the panel. I think, and it would just ground everything before we start getting into the nitty gritty. So, if there's no objection to that, then um, I think that's what we'll do. It'll be helpful. I think. Yeah, absolutely. No, I'll keep it brief and straightforward. But um, I'll just share my screen just a moment. I should say the panel has been to Rangatahi. Um, right. It was between lockdowns. I can't remember the exact date, but it was sort of. Or July, August, somewhere around about there, okay. um, and we had a, and we did have a good a good look around. We drove as far down the, the peninsula as we could, um, went across the new bridge and so forth. So we're we're generally familiar, but <clears throat> okay, no, that's great. Um, I actually can't share my screen. It's saying that it's host disabled. Ms. Kelly will be onto that in flash. Try now, Ben. Yeah, okay. How's that? Um, there we go. Okay. All right, so um, high level uh, Raglan uh, main township through here, the, um, the main street um, up in this area. And then I guess geographically people who know Raglan will be familiar with the one way bridge um, coming across into, from Raglan East to Raglan West. So the one-way bridge is, is here. Um, Dr. Mitchell mentioned that you went down uh, onto the peninsula. You would have gone down for the commissioners who went down uh, over to a road, which is here. Um, and that's been recently upgraded as an outcome of uh, Plan Change 12, a requirement of that um, from the intersection all the way down through here um, and the new bridge here, which replaced um, what was an old causeway structure, which had been there for many a year. Um, so this is the new bridge that Rangatahi constructed over into the peninsula. Um, there's half a dozen houses uh, which created Rangatahi, the Rangatahi development. They're on the peninsula here. Um, and previously they obtained access over this causeway uh, at low tide, as I understand it. Um, they now have access via the new bridge and a new right of way that comes up behind those houses there. Um, you'll hear us talking today uh, and you would have seen an evidence about the, the spine road. So this is the spine road, Rangatahi road that runs up through the, the centre of the peninsula and that will eventually continue down to service um, subsequent precincts uh, in the southern part of the, the structure plan area. Um, the northern part of the site is what's uh, referred to as precinct A um, and that's shown on the Rangatahi uh, peninsula structure plan. Uh, so Precinct A had titles issue in June of this year, and there's currently a few houses now under construction out there in a sales office, which sits in here. Um, and then the first part of Precinct B is, has been constructed and titled again in June uh, of this year. And so that's this area that sits in here. Um, there's also consents been approved for the balance of Precinct B um, into this area and Precinct D, which is in here. And Precinct D is currently under construction. Um, may not have been when you were out there uh, earlier in the year, um, or they might have just been getting started, but they're certainly well underway. So this area here is being bulk earthworked at the moment. Um, just for context, uh, Ragman Golf Club is in here. Uh, so you'll look across, so you can look across from the peninsula to the Ragman Golf Club. Um, to Hudawai Road is another road that came up um, through the plan change is, is a road that was being considered. So um, that's through here, winds its way up the hill. And um, the other thing that's relevant to your considerations today is that uh, in terms of the secondary access in particular is um, Bensonman Road and the connection between Bensonman Road and Hudawai Road. So that's um, as you work down the peninsula, uh, I believe here. Um, so Bensonman Road was upgraded. This is the construction route that um, all civil construction vehicles are using to get into the peninsula to construct it, um, which uh, keeps traffic off over to a road, but also as um, construction on Rangatahi goes south, obviously also keeps traffic off those roads that have been constructed um, in the northern part of the site, which is uh, an big driver for Rangatahi as well. Um, in a slightly broader sense, you've got um, Kuruoi out here, which is the mountain, and the beach. The beach is along, along here in the harbour entrance. So um, 
that's sort of the general context. Is that uh, sufficient, Dr. Mitchell, or is there anything else I, you want to delve into? I think that's helpful. Let's just see if there's any questions about that. Um, Mr. Cooney, anything that um, uh, just a just, scene set that would help you? Yeah, that, no, that's very good. Um, the alternative access for for trucks and uh, civil work. How much further is it along that road? Uh, so, if I dive in here, you'll see the access track. This is a, uh, an upgraded farm track, which comes down through the heart of the peninsula. Um, it continues as you can see, down through to here. And this is Bensonman Road in here, I believe. Let me just get my bearings in here. So um, it's, it's quite a long way around. Yeah. Um, it's, it's accepted and, and Rangatahi, as I say, for various reasons, has no intention to change that as a construction hall route. Um, as, as I say, quite apart from the wider community, there's also the Rangatahi residents to think about. and. Um, I don't imagine it's a great look trying to sell lots while having uh, trucks roaring through um, Precinct A, for instance, where they've got new residents moving in. So um, that is an accepted part of the, the environment. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Cooney. Ms. Sedgwick, anything just by way of scene set? No, I'm good, thank you very much. That's helpful. Mr. Marg? Uh, just one, Mr. Inger. Are you able to, because it, yeah, it's a great map. Where are the SNAs in location to the map? Uh, so this one doesn't obviously show them, but there are there are six. If you look at um, my attachment one, I think it is of my evidence in chief. Um, yes. And I'll just bring that up, and I'll try and sort of talk you through it with that in front of me. Um, so there's an SNA that runs along the edge of precinct A, along yep. here. And that's one that um, you'll see. There's also some um, zoomed in images of where it shows um, uh, areas where it intersects with roads, for instance. Um, there's another down in here. If you can see my cursor. Can you see my cursor, presumably? Yes, yeah. Yep. Down in here. There's one that comes up into this gully system in here. Um, and then I, there's I a, think what I might do, Mr. Inger, is actually put attachment one up rather than sort of having there wobbly hands sort of squiggling all over everything. I'll just, maybe you want to refer to that. Yeah, that'll be yeah. Does that help. I think that's probably a little bit more helpful. Yeah, would you like me to share that? Yeah, I, I, well, I've got it shared. You can, you can talk to yeah, it. I'll stop, okay. And you can tell me to, I mean, you can share it if you want, but, um, there's that map, that's, and then there's... Um, that's right, yeah. You, you tell me what you want to do. Yeah, if you go up to the first one, then um, attachment one, yeah. So that shows the SNAs across the entire peninsula. Um, so I was sort of working my way from, from top down the eastern side of the peninsula. Um, mm. you'll, see, you'll see it starts to get quite linear along that sort of southeastern side in particular. It essentially covers the entire coastal margin. Down here. Um, mm. Yep, that's right. And then on the west, it tends to come up the fingers, um, uh, which have sort of um, streams running through the bottom of them and down into the coastal, into the coastal area. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Just, just on those, um, you've got the, uh, are they... Are you are you guys satisfied they've been accurately mapped? Uh, no. Um, to the best of my knowledge, with the Rangatahi SNAs, they haven't been um, ground truth. So my understanding is that they're desktop based, and I, I think probably the one that um, I'm most familiar with, which is the Precinct A one um, that Dr. Mitchell's put up on the screen there, um, is evidence that. Um, uh, they don't necessarily make much sense relative to what's on the ground. I don't know about the others. Um, we haven't had any ecological investigation or, or work done to inspect those ourselves, but I haven't been able to find anything that indicates that um, uh, the council did a ground truthing exercise for those or, or indeed any um, substantial details about what the values are um, of each of those areas. Okay, well, we'll, we'll get on to this later during, during the actual evidence, but I just want to signal whether the company can ground truth them itself and then be satisfied that they can go in, because I think there's no 
you've got no real objection to them being identified as long as it's accurate. So maybe we can get on to that issue, but give it some thought in here. Yeah, I believe Ms. Parkinson is going to address that um, in the first instance yep. as well. No, that's good. Very good. All right, that's, is that, that's all you need to tell us at the moment. You don't want to refer to any of these other ones. Just again, we're not trying to get you to summarize your evidence. We're just trying to get the set, the scene set. Yeah, sure. I mean, this is just expanding, I guess, on what I was touching on, where um, the ones that we have been able to sort of ground truth, I guess, um, not in an ecological sense, but just looking at a comparison of what's been constructed versus um, where the SNAs lie show that um, yep. in four of these areas that there are SNA areas that overlap, areas that have been comprehensively effluent, and in some cases yep. um, subject to roads. Yeah. Okay, I think that's that's fine. That's good enough for now, I think. All right, I think I think that's very helpful. Thanks for that, Mr. Inga. That's so just back to, question. Oh, Can I just, sorry, Mr. 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 Fulton. That's right. Just on the uh, Benjamin Road and uh, Tehidua Road, that was the access to the peninsula prior to the um, causeway being built, was it? But I mean, when, when it was being as, as farmed as a farming operation, that's how the access was by that that road. Anyway, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And the roads are in a reasonable condition, isn't it? Obviously, to be able to have it as a farming operation down there all the time. Yeah, you're referring to Bensman Road itself yeah. or the farm track yeah. coming in? No, no the Bensman Road, and then, yeah. then you go on to the farm track. Yeah, that's right. So Bensman Road um, is in good condition um, and, and is being used, as I say, for heavy construction vehicles coming into the peninsula. The farm track itself was upgraded for um, to provide for that access and for construction vehicles and whatnot. Um, it's being used regularly by heavy vehicles coming in. Um, and, you know, I've, I've driven on it many times um, in a little Mazda 3, so it's, it works for two-wheel drive as well, um, no problem. Good, okay. Thank wasn't you. there a, a rickety old bench there? Did that only provide um, pedestrian access? I can remember uh, no. I was involved years and years ago with a rickety old bridge there. Yeah, the causeway um, did provide access. I understand it was limited to low tide, um, but that's how the six um, properties that I mentioned earlier on the northern tip of the peninsula obtained yeah. their access. The, the farm itself, um, uh, the Rangatahi farm, uh, uh, as I understand it, predominantly has always obtained access uh, through the southern part of the site. Okay. All right, thank you very much. That's a helpful scene set, I think. So if we get back to the normal um, course of business and um, Ms. Trenalp, if you are able to um, talk to us about your section 42A report and rebuttal version thereof, thanks. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. My name is Chloe Trenalp. I'm the 42A reporting planner for this topic. Um, and I did the rebuttal evidence. I did put through a, an opening statement on Friday. I'm not sure whether you've had a chance to see that and whether I should just read that or just kind of highlight through it. I was just going to pick a few points. No, that is one. I haven't seen that. Um, but I think if you can take us through that, that would be helpful. If you want to put it on the screen while you're doing so, that would be, that would be fine as well. Has, the, has, anyone, has, has anyone seen that? No, I haven't. That's fine, I can, I can uh, share that. Hopefully you can see, sorry, goodness me. Hopefully you can see that. Yes, thank you, that. yeah, that's, that's excellent. Okay. I'll just scroll, scroll through as I read. So just uh, paragraph one there is just introduction of myself and my qualifications as set out in my 42A and um, confirming that I um, agree to hear with a, you know, expert witnesses. So paragraphs two uh, and three and four are really just a description of the Rangatahi Peninsula Zone and the, the provision. So that's all um, just the summary of what's in the section 42A. So just the fact yep, that it's, no, that's all fine. its own zone provisions essentially in a couple of definitions. Mm -hmm. Paragraph five. So we had uh, 47 original submission points and 11 further submission points. And, and most of those were from Rangatahi 
limited in your, your saying that. Um, there's been some further discussion with myself and Mr. Inga on the plan provisions to reach generally um, agreement on, on those. And most of those um, in paragraph six, it's really around the um, transferal from the operative provisions into the proposed plan. And so tidying up some of those um, some of those things that happen when you're changing the framework slightly. So the, the key thing for that is in the operative plan, um, the, the planning framework required a comprehensive development plan as the first stage of consenting um, before other consents were, were able to occur. Now that, that particular tool isn't available, it's ultra-virus, so that had to be removed. And so in, in doing that, some of the plan provisions had to change from things like control to restrictive discretionary and just some of the way that sort of framework worked, if that makes sense. Um, so the other submissions were generally minor on, on specific matters um, and addressed those in the 42A. There generally wasn't any evidence from other submitters. There was a letter from the Ministry of Education disagreeing with my recommendation around the inclusion of educational facilities as a specific activity, as a restricted discretionary activity. And I talk about that a little bit further because that's really the only issue in contention. Uh, we also had a letter from uh, a table from Fire and Emergency New Zealand supporting the recommendation of the 42A. And just, um, I think in my rebuttal, I mentioned that I actually in regards to the secondary access, I spoke to Fire and Emergency New Zealand just to check what their position would, was on that <laughs> emergency access. Um, so, yeah, so because the provisions are generally in agreement between myself and Mr. Inga, there really isn't too much to go through. But um, for the purposes of focusing on the key matters, I think you will have picked up in the rebutted evidence in Mr. Inga's um evidence in his highlights package the key matters really are the secondary access significant natural areas and then also just variances in, in the submissions so just focusing firstly on the secondary access there's a policy and then there's um some currently some subdivision provisions that relate to the secondary access so that's being discussed it sounds like most people have got a handle on what the secondary access the requirement of the secondary access. Um, so the policy, we've, we've worked on the policy to give a bit more clarity around when it's required. And it, in talking to the council uh, do, when I was doing section 42A, uh, there was some in, in uncertainty at, at the time of resource consenting when the secondary access would be needed. And so that's why um, I understand there were some changes in the way that the policy framework and the rules um, applied in the proposed plan compared to the operative plan. But in doing that, it made it really overly onerous because the operative plan was really more when it was needed, when, when, when a secondary access would be needed. And, and it wasn't really clear about what this pur the purpose of this secondary access, of this permanent secondary access would be. So um, in the further discussions with both Mr. Inga and the evidence that Mr. Clark has provided um, and talking to the transport team, it really became clear that the primary focus of that secondary access was um, the construction traffic. And it sounds like um, Dr. Mitchell, you having been involved in that hearing may be useful because you may remember that discussion, but there was nothing in the um, decision that talked about needing that permanent secondary access for any other reason other than the construction traffic. Um, and there's certainly, in looking at Mr. Inga's description of where that is, it doesn't really provide a, a useful um, secondary access for sort of uh, access choice. So um, in terms of a secondary, a permanent secondary access, my position is that that may be something that might be useful in the future, but it would be better to be dealt with through future structure planning because that western land area is identified in Waikato 2017 for future urbanisation. Uh, so therefore, we focus the provisions on the, the resilience reason. So in addition to the uh, civil construction traffic, there was also some concerns that given it's a one-way in, one-way out bridge, 
how do you get in there if there's some sort of very, very rare occurrence of emergency where the bridge is blocked and maybe someone in the, um, in the precinct is having an emergency or a heart attack or a fire, how do you get services to that? So that's where I um, talk to um, the New Zealand emergency, sorry, New Zealand fire um, department in Raglan and was informed that they were comfortable that that metal access would be traversable by um, a fire truck and that there'd be alternative options as well to get across that bridge if there was an emergency there. Shall I just carry on into the yeah, 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 I think so, yes please. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not keeping it as short as my summary. But no, that's okay, it's all, it's, that's no problem. Yeah, the other thing I noticed when I was preparing this morning is um, what, what, I've, uh, what I've done is I've actually adopted Mr. Inger's um, recommended provisions for the policy and the relevant subdivision provisions so they're attached to his summary, uh, so his highlights package. Yes. I um, would have been useful actually if I had included them in my opening statement, which I have. Oh, no, no, that's okay. Do you want me to put, I've got them here. Do you want me to put I've them got, on the screen? I have um, added them into my... Oh, there we go. So I can put them up now if you want. Only if, only if you, only if you wish. I, I can bring them up if we want to discuss them, but I just so, so, so you, you're clear in my opening statement, what I'm saying is um, in addition to my rebuttal recommendation um, provisions, I am supporting those that Mr. Anker has attached. Yeah, okay. Um, so just so that's clear. Um, that's sorry, good, thank you. Hopefully you've still got my... Yes, we have. Okay. So then the second um, key issue is significant natural areas, and, and Mr. Kearney started um, traversing that question in, in the introduction. So... Uh, so the, my understanding is that, in, so if you look at the Rangitangi approved structure plan, there were always some areas of restoration, sort of the, the stream valleys and coastal edges that were proposed and anticipated to be revegetated and enhanced. I think at that time of the operative plan, there wasn't the significant natural areas. Um, and there was this process of a comprehensive development plan that would have figured out exactly where those were through the subdivision process. Now that we've got mapped significant natural areas, those have been picked up and they won't necessarily completely match um, because partly the, the structure plan is a indicative, um, an indicative map of, of areas that are there, but also intended sort of um, improvements. So there's a couple of areas, a couple of concerns about significant natural areas, and that was um, the fact that the peninsula is in the coastal environment, and obviously the work that has the council has done in terms of the significant natural areas hearing, hearing 21A, and I noticed the 42A planner for that topic is in the hearing today. So perhaps if there's any questions specific to um, how this relates to that hearing, she may be able to assist us. Um, but the main crux of it was that we, I, in my 42A, I tried to pick up the recommendations for hearing 21A, but in doing that created a bit of a, an inconsistency where we had identified permitted vegetation clearance, which was very limited to um, things like where, where vegetation was dangerous, um, things like that, very, very limited. And then it would trip into a trip into a discretionary activity, but then also picking up hearing 21A's recommendation that all vegetation clearance in an SNA should be a discretionary activity. So we had permitted activities, but then also a discretionary activity that was saying nothing was permitted. So in my 42A rebuttal, I have um, I've tidied that up and said that we should have some permitted activities, but very limited. And then there's a discretionary activity for everything else. And the policy um, on vegetation clearance and SNAs just provides some additional guidance about when um, vegetation clearance would be acceptable in SNA. And that is really around the fact that the structure plan identifies roads in a couple of places that go through those areas. And that's partly because they weren't SNAs at the time that they developed the structure plan. Um, 
and that may change when they come to do the future subdivision. But at this stage, there are roads intended to go through part of those SNAs. And so in order to implement subdivision in accordance with the structure plan, you have to have a process that enables consent to be so, uh, sought and obtained. So the plan provisions for those Mr. Inger and I agree on, and those are attached um, to my rebuttal evidence. Subdivision variances, um, these were uh, part of the operative plan provisions, and I think that in transferring these into the proposed plan, because we no longer have the comprehensive development plan process, the variances don't really work. And the intention was that um, it would give you a little bit of flexibility. So in order to be, a, I think it was subdivision as a controlled activity or restricted discretionary activity in the operative plan, and in order to keep the, that activity status, it gave you a bit of flexibility. So you could still be that lower order sort of activity status, but have some recognition that the structure plan isn't, isn't an exact science and some of those lines are gonna move a little bit. So, um, and moving into the proposed plan, subdivisions now restricted discretionary activity. So everything has to go through that process. The variances in Mr. Inger's experience do not help. Um, and they, because it's hard to actually determine whether you're at within 10 percent, for example, movement on the line when the scale of that structure plan is is not um, exact. So the work that has to go in to demonstrating that you're a strict discretionary activity is, is somewhat complicated and not really adding too much to the process. So as a restricted discretionary activity, you have to apply for consent for subdivision. You need to be consistent um, as an assessment criteria with the um, structure plan and that seems to be sufficient to um, assess that, those issues. Mr Inger has um, accepted and proposed that um, only one of those is useful in terms of its certainty and that's that you could have up to 10% increase in the number of dwellings. That's partly understand and, and approval of the structure plan it was intended to be sort of 500 to 550 dwellings. So obviously as things move through and the structure plans implemented, um, these things are developed a bit more in, in, in the more finer grain detail. So some of those numbers are likely to change and that's a dwelling numbers was an easy one to calculate as opposed to um, areas of land and, and line. So that's the three sort of main issues in terms of the actual um, structure plan provisions. The only main uh, matter that's really in contention is this issue of the Ministry of Education um, in terms of educational facilities. So educational facilities is not identified as an activity at all, and that means that it defaults to a non-compliant activity, and that was the concern of the Ministry of Education. And I understand this was a similar issue raised in the residential hearing, and um, it's now recommended to have it as a restricted discretionary activity in the residential area, residential zone, sorry, but it currently remains a non, would be a non-compliant activity in Rangatahi because it's not specifically identified. So I did not talk about this in my rebuttal because I didn't um, have a change of position. I still am um, of, of the view that this area is not likely to be an area where you would have um, for example, a primary school or a high school, something that the Ministry of Education would be um, involved in. In the letter um, submitted by the Ministry of Education, I just mentioned in paragraph 21, also accepts that it is unlikely, but they still don't like the non-compliant activity status. So they've said that if um, that's not acceptable, they would be comfortable with a discretionary activity status. I still don't think that's necessary. I think that they have... Um, the designation powers available to them if that was something that they really felt was appropriate in this area or subsequently in the future as the urbanisation of this area gets larger and that might be an option, perhaps that might change for the, for the wider area. So I don't think um, educational facilities needs to be specifically identified. Child care facilities is identified as a specific activity, it's a controlled activity and that is, I think, the probably most likely um, the activity that would occur in this area. So um, then the final paragraph there, 22, I've just added that if the panel did support the Ministry of Education's 
proposal to, either is to identify it as a restricted discretionary activity um, or a discretionary activity, that there would need to be a policy to support that, I believe, because particularly if it's a discretionary activity, because um, there's nothing in the Rangatahi objectives and policies that specifically would deal with that, and it is a um, pretty much standalone set of provisions. So overall, the, the provisions are generally agreed, both the objectives and policies, the um, definitions and um, rules, and the only uh, matter of contention is the education facilities. So thank you, that concludes my summary, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Ms. Trenow. Uh, let's see if there are any, any questions of you. I think the, the only thing that we would say at the, at the outset is that the, the SNA hearing was fairly involved um, and the Section 42A report provisions um, probably aren't going to stay the same as they are. Um, we'll perhaps explore that a little bit more and get your personal opinion on some things. Um, as we as we go through, and there may well be some questions of you at a at a philosophical type level, if you if you if you like. So let's see how we go, um, Mr. Fulton. Any questions from you? No, I've got no questions. Thank you, Ms. Sedgwick. Oh no, not at this point. But thank you, Mr. Mark. Uh, nothing from me. Thank you, uh, Mr. Luth. Mr. Cooney. Um, <coughs> yes, um, I, know, I I don't want to. Um, um, I don't want to get involved in something that's probably agreed on, but wh why do you need an, an alternative access uh, here? I can think of um, many established areas where there's only one, one access in, and um, it just seems to me to be a, a bit of a belts and braces approach. So, um, you know, why... Why do you need that act, alternative access? It's a pretty substantial bridge. Thank, thank you, Mr. Kearney. I think that's a really good question and um, one that Mr. Anger and I discussed relatively extensively, probably the main thing that we've discussed over the few weeks. I um, am. I, I agree. I think that the with you, and Mr. Kearney, there is many areas that have only one access in and out, and Mr. Clark's evidence is really helpful in that regard. And Mr. Inger had in his evidence sought the removal of those provisions subsequent to my 42A. The issue I had um, was that the council transport um, transportation team were very concerned about resilience and if there was an emergency. So in that regard, um, we felt that it was okay to retain the provision for a alternative access, but really clarify its purpose. So the, the way the provisions are written now, uh, maybe this would be a useful time for me to share them. I'll just put them up. Yep. Is, is the related issue is that the, the, the main access is also via another bridge before you get to that bridge, which is um, already separating east from west? Is that part of the story from your point of view? Well, if, ultimately, it's part of the story, but I guess it's actually more, it, it seems to be that that bridge would be much more of an issue than, than blocking than if the... Um, the, the the, the new one, the, the new, new bridge. bridge. Yeah, yes, the new bridge. The new bridge is, is two ways. It's um, recently constructed. It's very wide. It's got plenty of capacity. The chances of it blocking or coming, you know, or, or being closed seem to be very, 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 very slim compared to the Winery Road Bridge, which is one way. Um, so that's a bigger issue and, and possibly um, one of the ongoing concerns for the area. But um, so what the provisions, so hopefully you can see this document on the screen, it's got policy. Yes, we can, thanks. So um, I've just the green is, is, the, is the additional wording that Mr. Inger has proposed in his um, highlights package, attachment one. So what we've done is we've, this is recognizing that as part of the approved subdivision, this 
alternative access is already there, this metal, metal access that Mr. Anger talked about, and that's for the purpose of civil construction traffic. And that was because um, residents of the existing urban area didn't want that traffic going past. So that's already there, that's required to remain there during civil construction. Um, but it's also available or, or traversable by emergency vehicles if it needs to be there. So we've just changed the policy so that um, it's recognising that it needs to be there from the beginning, where it's providing access to, so it's to Bensonman Road, and that what its use is for heavy vehicles. And so we've gotten rid of the, the, the reference to permanent secondary access because if you were to build a secondary access, it, it would just be hugely expensive and not useful for um, transport choice and very rarely used from an emergency basis. So didn't, it just didn't seem to be necessary. Um, so the second part recognises that, that an easement could be provided um, for that secondary access. And I understand Mr. Inger has talked to uh, or has legal advice on that matter, but so maybe he might be best to talk about how that works. Um, his main concern, the, the, the developer wasn't, wasn't actually seeking to remove, initially to remove the secondary access because it's already there, it's intended to be used. Um, so there's, there's no issue with having that alternative access there. It's really the permanent access that's the, the concern. If you were required to construct a formed um, secondary access road, the, the cost and impact of that, that, that is the, the main concern. So there isn't really any harm in retaining a, an alternative access that's already in place um, and could be, could be accessed by, by emergency vehicles if needed. So in a way we've kind of have gotten rid of the requirement but are still maintaining this alternative access in, in the event that it is needed, if that makes sense. All right, thank you. Uh, the other the other issue um, is um, what's what's the downside in providing for an education facility here? They, they come in all shapes and forms, of course, um, and and so so why can't you provide for it? Why and why do you need a policy to promote that? It's just just a part and parcel of the urban development, isn't it these days? So, yeah, I mean, the, the reason why I didn't support having it in there is because the structure plan hadn't anticipated it, and it, it is um, a one-way, not a one-way, sorry, but, but, but one way in, one way out. So if you were going to have a large-scale education facility, it didn't seem to, to make sense, and they were asking for it as a restricted discretionary activity. So I, I felt that um, there wasn't perhaps enough um, guidance on what was anticipated. If it was a, a small scale type facility, maybe that would be okay. And there were no other sort of education providers submitting on it. It was just the Ministry of Education. So I guess I was coming from a larger education facility perspective. The reason why I think if you were to um, include it, you'd need a policy, particularly it was really if it was a discretionary activity. So the submission for Ministry of Education did actually provide some matters of discretion and some provisions that they were recommending. It wasn't simply just the activity. So if you did want to accept the submission, there are some provisions there for you to, to do that. Um, if you felt that it should be a discretionary activity, then I think you would need a, a policy just to guide what's, how you would actually assess that. So that was really what I was meaning about the, the, the need right. of policy. Thank you. Um, are you finished, Mr. Kearney? That yeah, thank you. Just if I could just start with the, the question of, of SNAs and just um, how you see that working, because Mr. as I read Mr. Inger's evidence, he said no one's ground truth them as yet. But some of some of them are obviously wrong because they're in the middle of areas that have been heavily earthworked. You know, there's already roads that have been constructed and they're showing on the planning map. So he's he's he hasn't said this is where the SNAs are as such. He's just said these four locations aren't clearly aren't correct because they're already not vegetated. How how do you see in practice us resolving? 
that issue, bearing in mind that the SNAs in the plan generally, a lot of them are on rural land and there aren't any development pressures directly on them. It's not like we've got a, you know, a development proposal on the table as there is here. Um, and I just wonder what your thoughts on, on how we might uh, get that to a, to a resolution. And, and I think Mr. Cooney mentioned at the start, one way might be for someone to ground truth them so that they can be included as a mapped area. Um, I think it's fair just so that you're aware that the panel was pretty, um, pretty, how would I put this, dissatisfied with, and it's not, it's not the district council's fault, but there was a heavy reliance on information from the regional council GIS database, which is done at a very high level um, spatially. So it's, it's indicative rather than accurate. And, and a lot of the mapping is, is just plain wrong at the moment, as, as some of it is here, obviously. Um, we were pretty nervous about having unground truthed SNAs, and this is, we haven't formed a final view on, on that yet, but we, we were pretty reluctant to start putting SNAs all over the place, um, given the blight that it put on private land. If you see what, if you take yeah. my, take my point. I'm not trying to poo-poo the importance of significant natural areas because they're clearly important, but they need to be identified properly. So anyway, it's a very long-winded little monologue. But what, how, how do you think in a practical sense we can, we can come to a landing on this, given that this is a development proposal um, that is a bit different from, you know, a, a bush block on a, on a 200 hectare farm that is rurally zoned? Yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. Um, I did think about, um, as I was looking at, at this issue, the fact that Rangatahi is a development area and so is a little bit more, more tricky. As I mentioned earlier, when the, the structure plan maps would have been developed, um, that these weren't anticipated to be significant actual areas, although they would have similar outcomes. So there's a consistency there. I guess what I, I'm just thinking as you were talking about, there's two, there's two options and, and you mentioned it earlier, whether the Rangatahi could ground truth them. I guess that's one option. They could go down and, and ground, ground truth them themselves and, and provide a more specific map. Another thing could be because this is essentially an urban area, you could rely on the structure plan maps, which have indicative um, re landscape restoration areas, which was the original um, intention of how it was going to be implemented. So you would, there were would, would requirements around these landscape protection areas and, and the enhancement that would happen through, through the subdivision process. So that could be another way of dealing with it in this location. And I haven't gone down that track. Um, so I don't have um, a worked up sort of scenario for you on that. Um, and I think it was probably, um, that's an assumption here, when this was rolled over that because the council was having SNAs through the proposed plan that it seemed like the same tool and you could just replace one with the other and perhaps that hasn't quite worked. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, no, that's helpful. I suppose the question is, and maybe that's what you were alluding to, do, do we need SNAs here at all? And can they not be controlled by general development rules that says, you know, avoid areas containing X, Y, and Z? Or, I mean, do they need to be mapped? Do they need to be specifically identified? And you've mentioned maybe the structure plan might suffice. Yeah. I don't think they do necessarily need to be mapped because they are essentially mapped in the structure plan as mm. enhancement areas and there's always an intention that the developer would enhance and, and develop and protect those. So in some respects, I think the structure plan was actually seeking to enhance those areas rather than um, remove them or, or destroy them. Um, and Mr Inga had mentioned to me before that the um, the landowner has actually done significant planting in some of these areas and, and in some cases would have to be removing some of the, the planting that they've already put in. So it, it seems that it is something that wouldn't necessarily um, 
I, I, I agree um, that it, it could be dealt with through the structure plan and through plan provisions rather than having them as an act you see now. I, maybe I can take that one step further. I was wondering whether we needed to refer in, in the Rangatahi sense to SNAs at all. Oh, sorry, that's what I meant. Yes. Is that what you mean? There, yes, there are no SNAs per yes. se. There are rules relating to that's the areas right. that otherwise might be considered to be SNAs. Is that, is that what yes, you're saying? That's what, I, that's what I was thinking. So, yeah, I mean, you'll, you'll see in the plan provisions that actually a lot of the rules that have been rolled in around SNAs have been removed anyway. So there's not much left. So it would make sense to actually have a, a more bespoke um, set of rules that deal with those areas and, and relate to um, the relevant structure plan map and actually ex expressly say what, what the intention is. No, that's, that's helpful, thank you. Just a couple of things around the secondary road. Presumably, at some point in the future, somebody will say there needs to be a Rangatahi stage two, and, and that development will push, um, get my bearings right, push south. Um, when that starts to happen, people coming into Raglan would probably want to have the option, or the developers of that land, if that were to happen, wouldn't want the opportunity of coming through Bensonman Road, for example, foreclosed upon because someone had built a farmhouse on it or, a, I don't know, put a dairy shed or something like that on it. So isn't part of the secondary access about future-proofing access for some future as yet unthought of scenarios, but so that those sorts of things aren't foreclosed upon? Uh, that may be the case, but it's not on any maps. So no, 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 I understand that. So there was no way of knowing where that was supposed to be or really what the function was. But in, in any future, I guess it depends how develop, how that urbanisation would occur. I was envisaging that there would be a, a structure plan process as part of that that would identify then where that um, secondary access, yes. permanent secondary access would go. And yes, at some point, obviously, you, you are, you're going to, I don't know whether you would start that development, you know, close to the existing road and then move to Rangatahi or from Rangatahi. So I don't mm, know. No, no, and that's so a fair you'd point. You'd hope that it would all be done comprehensively so that you would at least have that future proofing um, determined and then you might stage it along that, that route. So, but if that's the case, then why do you need 9.3.5.4b at all? For the, I mean, why would you need to create an easement for that? Because it's not under any any threat or under pressure. I would have thought the only pressure that might arise in the future is some sort of development that says, well, we need to have an easement to make sure that we can continue to use that area. Yeah, I, I can't disagree. I, I don't think that it necessarily needs to be there. I mean, it, it's already there. As I, as I mentioned, that secondary access is there. Mm, so mm, whether mm. you need to protect it or not is really whether um, whether the council or other parties feel that it is in threat. At threat, I think that it goes through the landowner's farm. Mr. Inger probably is best to okay. respond to that question in more detail. But um, it was really more probably B is really more around explaining what it's for, whether you need an easement, maybe you don't need an easement, but at least it, it clarifies that if there's any doubt um, by parties, if for example the farm was sold to somebody else, not the person that we're dealing with now, that that access would need to be maintained. So it just, it is a bit of a, a about some braces. Okay, no that's helpful, thank you. Can I just ask you though about both of those policies? They, and this is a bugbear of mine and it's not personal. <laughs> personal to you, but they read more like rules than policies. You know, fr um, from the beginning of development, a secondary access shall be provided. Do you have any thoughts on, on that and, and whether that sort of conforms to good drafting or not? Good question. Um... Similarly with B, you know, shall yeah. be created. You know, and it's specific as to timing following construction of the spine road, etc. 
they, they do read a bit, you know, they're very sort of, I guess, I would say maybe more directive rather than, than as rules. There are no, um, the only, there aren't any really specific rules relating to this policy. So essentially what's happening in this lower, in this, um, in the subdivision provision, rule 28.4.1, mm. as a restricted discretionary activity, um, it's, a, it's actually only a matter for, for discretion to consider those points. So um, it doesn't lead to any specific rules. So I, it's trying to be clear. Well, I'm wondering why they're needed at all for that reason, yeah. because they are matters of discretion. Um, and um, you could, you could, for example, in Rule 28.4.1, you could have what's in the policy in the rule. So it could be a, a conditions precedent that says you're only, you're only um, able to subdivide if you firstly ensure that those things happen. And then discretion is, re is, is reserved over the detail. It just, it just, I know it's belts and braces, but it looks like belts and braces and then another pair of braces and, you know. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree. You don't, you don't really need the- may I mean, not need it, okay. You may not need it. It's whether, I guess there's an issue around potentially provisions cascade, whether you think you need to have some sort of a policy to, to, to cascade down into that rule. But right. at yep. this stage, okay. it's really just repeating, the policy is really being repeated in the, in the activity, okay. so. No, that's good, thank you. Simplified. Final final question is in relation to the drafting of Rule 28.4.1a Roman 1. This is the 10% variance provisions. And I think I'll um, I don't think you drafted it. So well you may have you may have drafted this, this these provisions because they're in blue. I think you might have. Do you think that's particularly clear as to what it means? if you haven't been involved in either the development of the structure plan or this hearing, where it says the subdivision must be within an upper range of 10% of the dwellings illustrated. I think the intention of that is to say there's a certain number shown in the illustration and you can go 10, you can go 10% above that without crossing the line. Is that, that's yeah. the intention, isn't it? That is the intention, yeah. Maybe I'll leave it at that and just perhaps suggest that you and Mr. Inger have a think about how to make that easily understandable by people that didn't do the drafting. Sure, yeah. Because there's a quite a lot of implied knowledge about that provision. But I must say, when I read the provision, I had to go back to the evidence to see what the hell it was all about. Okay. And I think we should be, I think generally speaking, it's, it makes sense for those provisions to be able to be read on their face. Okay. Yeah, that could be tidied up for sure. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for your summary and um, answering of our questions. That's very helpful. Thank you. Ms. Parkinson. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. So, I think um, that opening statement has really narrowed down what we had as a high level of agreement to virtually complete agreement. Uh, I'm just going to keep my submission relatively brief and try and pick up on some of those points that were um, arising for the secondary access and the mapping of, of SNAs. Uh, so I think just picking up on the secondary access, the um, as Mistress knows, very um, helpfully summarised, the main concern for the submitter um, is that there's a distinction in the um, both the operative policy and the proposed policy between the um, what was called the interim alternative access and the permanent secondary access. Um, Rangatahi um, would support retaining some provisions for the um, interim alternative access, which is already formed as a metal access already incorporated into um, resource consent conditions. Uh, and we accept that there's some um, evaluation of the need for that um, secondary access to provide some resilience, although um, Mr. Clark's evidence really does call 
that into question. Um, however, it's there uh, and it, it is being used by construction traffic and the intention is it will continue to be used by construction traffic uh, and it can certainly be used as an emergency access for emergency vehicles if that is needed. Uh, in terms of um, whether that needs to be legally protected, um, Rangatahi um, certainly has no intention of, of um, precluding emergency um, vehicles from using it um, and uh, would accept an, an easement and gross if that is carefully drafted and I don't think that needs to be really addressed in any detail in the district um, plan. Um, but if it's drafted to expire, if at some future point there is a permanent secondary access, um, then Rangatahi would, would be accepting of, of an easement. Um, for future proofing um, and whether there does need to be a secondary access, um, at, at this point um, Rangatahi says and, and the evidence shows that um, the existing primary access is more than sufficient for the structure plan area and the development that's contemplated in that structure plan area. Uh, we say that any um, future need for a secondary access should be assessed through um, a structure planning process. Uh, and as I've signalled in um, my submissions, Rangatahi is presenting on the uh, zone ex extent um, hearing and um, will be presenting evidence around future um, urban growth in that area being addressed through a structure planning process. So that, that's our primary submission is that the secondary access um, it doesn't need to be referenced as a permanent legal road with all of the um, formation costs, all the environmental effects that go with forming a permanent road. Um, and there is no section 32 evaluation to support those provisions coming through. Um, for the existing metalled access, we would accept some um, provisions coming through. And Dr. Mitchell, just picking up on your points, um, I agree the policy is not really worded as, as a policy with methods to implement it. Um, we have tried to really adopt what is the operative and then proposed um, wording with adjustments to make it clear what the purpose of that road is, but it could certainly do with some further tweaking to make it read more as a policy or I guess, is it actually necessary to have that? Can it just come through as an assessment criteria for, for a subdivision? Um, I suppose the, uh, so the points I wanted to pick up on from um, the section 42A rebuttal uh, is that the existing um, formation as a metal access is um, considered to be sufficient for emergency vehicles, it's certainly sufficient for the construction traffic. Uh, and so Rangatahi are content to have um, an assessment criteria that requires them to maintain that metal access way um, to, to that standard. Um, the, the easement, um, the one major concern there, which Mr. Inga can address you in a bit more detail, is that uh, if we were to have an easement, there is periods during the um, construction of each precinct where the earth, um, bulk earthworks uh, mean that there isn't any access through um, the precinct and through the structure plan area using this alternative access way because it's earthworked. Uh, and the um, preference is to have that easement coming into place once the spine road is completed. So at the completion of, um, bas basically completion of construction of the precincts. Um, at that point in time, an easement could be put in place um, to protect that alternative um, access for emergency purposes um, going into the future. Uh, so that that's really the position of the submitters, the submitter on the um, secondary access. Uh, in terms of the SNAs, uh, I have 
noted from the section 42A rebuttal that this was raised in hearing 21A uh, and potentially um, there were concerns around having those SNAs coming through um, into the district plan when they haven't been ground truth. So in terms of um, Rangatahi, um, the submitter accepts that the peninsula is within the coastal area and is, is subject to the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement um, and in that respect um, supports retaining a policy um, with Mr Inga's amendments um, as, as set out in his um, evidence. Um, Mr Inga will ad address um, you on some further adjustments to um, policy 9.3.3.7c um, to be consistent with um, chapter three policies around um, the sig avoiding significant adverse effects um, and, and picking up on some earlier work that was done for plan change 12 and eco an earlier ecological report um, for, for the peninsula. Um, so subject to that, um, in terms of the, the SNAs, um, Mr Inga has identified some um, areas where the mapping could be adjusted. Um, as he's responded, um, these aren't ground truth. Um, there was earlier ecological reporting for Plan Change 12, uh, which did identify values and um, some at-risk species. So it does indicate at um, just at that level that the SNAs and protection is appropriate. Um, uh, Rangatahi is willing to share those existing reports um, and assessments, um, but in my submission, um, Rangatahi shouldn't be undertaking the primary assessment or ground truthing of those SNAs. Um, it is a um, plan that's promoted by the council and council should have that cost of, of ground truthing those SNAs. Um, having said that, Rangatahi is, it would be willing to work um, with the council and, and share the information that it does have um, existing at the moment. Um, it did occur to me in, in just sort of reading through the rebuttal and, and listening to the questions, um, given the higher order policy documents, um, it does seem appropriate to have at least a policy framework for SNAs um, in the district plan and in uh, the Rangatahi zone particularly um, because uh, th there has been earlier work that's recognised um, the values in the peninsula uh, but perhaps have the mapping to follow um, to give effect to that policy framework um, so that's just a suggestion that I would make um, as one further option, um, keep the policy framework, but um, have the detailed mapping work done uh, later. Um, in terms of um, mapping the SNAs, Rangatahi considers that it would also be important to um, record the values of those SNAs um, so that the, the assessment of any, um, any activities uh, can be targeted to those values. Um, I think that's really all the points that I need to address unless there was anything arising out of my submission that um, the commissioners wanted to hear from me on. Um, I, I think I'd commend um, the two planners for cooperating so so. Um, well, and on an ongoing basis. So this has been something that's um, followed through from um, before the notification of the plan, um, after the notification, through the whole evidence exchange um, process. And I think um, the high level of agreement reflects that cooperation. All right, let's just see if there are any questions. It may well pay to write, wait until we hear, hear the evidence, um, but let's just see. Um, Mr. Mar, do you have any questions? No, not at this stage, thank you. Ms. Sedgwick? 
um, I'm not sure whether my question should be preferentially um, addressed to Mr. Inga, but I am, I am, I want to be really clear that I've understood uh, the um, alternative access in that uh, what is the intention that uh, post-construction, when all the construction vehicles are out, am I correct in assuming that will be maintained as a farm road and for emergency vehicles? Is, is that, am I right on that? Uh, that? That is the present intention and uh, what Rangatahi says is that in terms of uh, any future proofing or any future further development in, in Raglan West or in the Rangatahi Peninsula, that, that will need a plan, changing, a plan change process. Um, and so the need for a secondary access, the route of that secondary access, um, the formation standard for that secondary access can all be addressed at that later um, stage. Um, so it's it's premature right, to bring it into um, the plan change at the moment as a requirement certainly for the structure plan development area. I just have an interest in um, the unknown unknowns, if you like, and having sat on Auckland's motorways sometimes for what seems like days when trucks have inexplicably turned over um, or inexplicably just dropped a load or done done something. Um, to me, there is, there is a, a crucial element in emergency access and also egress for the people who live there. If, if, it, if for example, in the, in the if this Clark says the unforeseen, never, never likely possibility, um, that the bridge was blocked. And so I think I'm getting a degree of comfort here. I just want to be clear that my understanding is, is as you see it. And certainly at that pragmatic level of um, in the unfortunate event of, of all access otherwise being closed, um, then the submitter is um, content to have that access um, retained and protected um, going forward. Uh, just my last one, is that, will that be, at the moment, will, is that forming also part of a farm road access into the area? It, it, it is. Um, so it, it is formed as a farm track and it is used as a farm track. Um, so part of the concern around the permanent secondary access is that it hasn't been um, fully assessed. Um, the route of that access and um, the formation of that to a legal road standard hasn't been considered as yet. Um, so the concern um, was having some... Uh, expectation that that farm track would become a, a permanent legal road in the future or even um, you know available just generally for um, residents to use um, mm -hmm. that's going to conflict with the farm activities so we want to have um, a, if, if there is protection through an easement it has to be tightly drafted um, and restricted to those very unusual emergency circumstances um, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Mr. Um, Mr. Fulton. You know, thank you, Ms. Ferguson. No, thank you very much. Made it very clear. I'm happy. Thank you. Mr. Kearney. No, thank you. Just one question from, from me, and it's perhaps I'll, I'll pose it now, whether it's best for you to answer it, Ms. Parkinson, or to leave it to Mr. Clark or Mr. Inger. The question around I mean, it seems that while the peninsula is being developed, there's agreement that for construction purposes, the road, the secondary access road needs to be maintained because that's where the construction traffic enters from, other than the caveat about being able to get all the way through when you're doing earthworks on the, in the immediate precinct that's mm -hmm. being developed. But couldn't you address that rather than creating an easement or having anything formal in the plan, by the time you get to the last precinct, isn't and the, the situation is much clearer, isn't that the, the time to address what might happen in the future going forward? Because it, it would be the precinct that's closest to the, to the 
end of that secondary access, the furthest point away from the main bridge, in other words. And it just seems to me that, that we're using a sledgehammer to crack a nut because by the time the construction is finished, it may, or before construction is finished, there may be new structure planning implementation, or sorry, new structure plan proposals in place. And if there weren't, at the time of that subdivision, it would be very easy to, to then come back and address the secondary access point as a condition of that subdivision consent. Do you think that is a possibility? Um, certainly, I mean, we're, the, the submitter has um, been concerned, it would be fair to say, about um, the connectivity um, through the um, structure plan area, area and, and then out to Bensonman Road. You know, where, where does that um, connectivity occur? How does it, how does it um, pass through um, over the boundary? Um, so there is a lot of uncertainty in um, protecting something which isn't which isn't mapped, which isn't assessed. Um, uh, the easement and actually the the original evidence that um, Mr. Inger um, submitted asked for this to be deleted in its entirety. Um, so the retention of the policy and the assessment criteria is is uh, attempting to meet the concerns that have been raised in the 42A. Yeah, okay, no, that's so, fine, that's helpful. Yeah. Uh, but I, do, I would say that um, the submission that will be put forward in the zone extent hearing um, is to have that structure planning exercise occurring sooner rather than later so that that certainty can, can be achieved. Okay, no, that's helpful, thank you very much. Um, I think what we might do is we might take our morning tea break for 15 minutes and do that now um, and then that that will give um, Mr Inga time to think a little bit about some of the questions that we've already posed and he might be able to have a think about those maybe discuss them with you um, Ms Parkinson and with Mr Thank Clark you. so I think we'll adjourn now and we'll come back at 25 to 11 and if you please don't log off this session just mute your microphone and turn your um, video off if you want to do something else but um, yeah, don't log off and we'll, we'll see you back in 15 minutes. Thanks everybody, w welcome back. Ms. Um, Parkinson, do you want to um, call your witnesses please? I believe she hasn't joined us yet, uh, Dr. Mitchell. So, um, do you want to wait a minute or two, or should we get on with um, Mr. Clark? Oh, I'm, I'm. Um, maybe we'll give her a, a minute. Otherwise, then I think we'll we'll probably proceed. While we have a pause, I make sure people can hear me because I've got a water blast to cont to contend with behind me. Yes, no, you sound good as gold, thank you. Good. I shut all the windows to block it out. It's very hot in here. She's with us now. Here she is, she's back. Ms Parkinson, do you want to um, call your witnesses, please? Sorry, <laughs> sorry, double hitting mute. <laughs> That's all right, no problem. Uh, so, thank you. Um, we'll call Mr. Clark um, first to um, give his evidence as a traffic planner. And he's, he has prepared a um, summary statement, so he will just speak to that. Yeah, and we're happy. Um, I mean, it's only three pages long, but we don't need you to read it per se. We're keen for you to just highlight what it is that you're wanting to tell us. Sure. Good morning, all. Morning. So you have my evidence in chief and the summary. As you just said, the summary is really very brief. Uh, taking paragraphs one and two as read, it's really the, op the opening um, introductory statements. Paragraph three just repeats the summary from my main evidence. And I say I support the concept 
our secondary access is for new developments of a certain size and principle. Of a certain size is a very vague statement, but I've looked around and have struggled to find any guidance on what is the right number at which point to provide a secondary access. And for that reason, I went looking around the country, it was seen in the evidence, various examples of places that do or don't mainly have secondary access points. And I found many examples, I could have gone further, of um, areas of a bigger size or serving more people than here without two points in and out. So going to paragraph 3B, uh, the need for a secondary access here to service the development of up to between 500 to 550 households posed on the Rangatahi Peninsula is not clear in this case, particularly now that the primary access via the new bridge connection to the pre-existing section of Opotru Road is now fully established. And the secondary access, as you've heard, is not really required for capacity reasons or safety reasons, but it appears to be recommended solely for reasons of resilience, and as you've heard, also for construction traffic. So my paragraph, it was 31, looked at the resilience benefits of a secondary access and concluded that it's likely to be minor benefit in this case. The main reason for that is the fact that all the secondary access does, it gets you back to a different point within West Raglan. So you still have the resilience issue of the one lane bridge. So therefore, the reasons are really for these unusual events that I set out in my evidence and Ms. Trenuth repeated in her paragraph 31, which are all around those planned or unplanned events when things go wrong. So when there's a crash in the wrong place or when you've got roadworks, which are clearly planned, but they're temporary incidents, or when you get things like flooding or slips, now, I'm not giving engineering or flood evidence, but it, you, you think that the new bridge will be built to normal modern standards. So therefore you would think that the chances of a um, unplanned act of God, I would say, are fairly minor. Hence you are really left with what happens when something goes badly wrong at the same time as there is a medical or a fire emergency. That's the reason I've concluded the resilience benefits of this secondary access are likely minor in this case. So then the potential wider future growth of Raglan West, as envisaged by Raglan, sorry, Waikato 2070, may be the more appropriate means to secure the secondary road link through to Rangatahi. So in response to Ms. Trenuth, as she said, he states further amendments to the policy may be appropriate. She notes that there is a desire within the council's transport team to retain the requirement for secondary access, really for emergencies. And we've noted the need for the use by construction traffic. So therefore, Mr. Inger and Ms. Trenuth have suggested these revised uh, provisions which I believe is now an agreed outcome between the experts. So I support the agreed outcome. I note that the, the current farm track is suitable for these purposes, being um, construction access, uh, emergency access, without the need for a further upgrade. Just briefly before we get to the questions, there was a question from Mr. Cooney around the length of the secondary access. And that is fortuitously covered in my evidence at figure three, which is on page nine of my evidence in chief, which was based on Google Maps. And it suggested that the secondary route will be around 7.8 kilometers to get to a point at the northern end of the peninsula. And that will be, yeah, that's the one there. there, there. Yes. And if you were taking the primary access straight from Wainui Road, it probably more like a point eight of a kilometer. So it's about an extra seven kilometers to that point there. Happy to take questions. 
Thank you, Mr. Clark. Let's, let's see if there are any questions. Mr. Fulton. No, I think just picking up on your point, though, <clears throat> it's, it's, it almost seems a bit like an overkill, uh, is the point you're making. And um, I think that's something we've got to consider. But um, <clears throat> I think that's, that's a fair point, isn't it? That's, that's what you're raising? I think if there was no farm access, we will be pushing for no requirement for a secondary route. Yeah. Because it's there, then the client is happy to have it provide, uh, maintained. But if it wasn't there, yes, I'm saying it's, um, I'm not sure of overkill, it's covering the very unusual possibility of there being something going wrong. I think there's only one other parallel that I'm aware of in the District Council, and that is a very similar situation at Spring Hill Prison, which has an access through property for different reasons. But um, I think it's a, a similar position that I'm aware of. But OK, right. thank you. No further questions. Thanks, Mr. Fulton. Ms. Sedgwick? No, I'm fine. Thank you very much for your clarity, Mr. Clark. Mr. Mao? No, no, thank you. Mr. Kearney? No, thank you. Thanks very much. No, and I don't have any questions either, Mr. Clark, although it may be that when, when we hear from Mr. Inger that there may be some um, assistance you can provide in the context of the planning provisions, but your evidence itself is, is very clear. So thank you for that. Thank you. Just when you're ready, Mr. Inger, I... Uh, yes, so um, I'll do the formalities. Um, Rangatahi calls Mr. Inga to provide um, his planning evidence, and he's Thank also prepared a summary statement. Thanks. Thank you. Um, look, some of the issues have been already fairly well traversed, and so, um, in particular, the sort of context to them. So, although I've got a summary statement, I'll um, I'll look to do a summary of my summary statement, and um, and then we can address any any questions. Um, so, in particular, um, the background I think is, has been well covered um, in terms of understanding where, where how we've got to where we have with the, with the plan change and, and so forth, and um, and some of the key changes. Um, that have come through in the proposed district plan, which are addressed in my evidence. Um, Ms. Trenuth has explained uh, some of those in a bit more detail, um, which is uh, which is helpful, but I'm happy to address any questions um, you might have on those. Um, in terms of key matters, I've, um, I've structured my evidence based on 12 submission topics, but I think um, the three key ones uh, are secondary access, significant natural areas and subdivision variants in relation to the structure plan and uh, they're probably the topics that we've, we've covered most um, to date this morning. Um, in respect of the secondary access, uh, as Ms. Trenuth has said, she and I have covered this at length through numerous conversations and, um, and where that got to following Mr. Clark's um, helpful evidence on the matter was my evidence in chief uh, suggesting that the secondary access provisions uh, come out entirely from the district plan. Um, and that was in reliance on, on Mr. Mr. Clark's evidence, uh, at, which he's just summarised uh, for you now. Um, subsequent to that, Ms. Trenuth and I have had further discussions and, and you've heard that there's a willingness to, to um, address concerns that have been raised through Council's transport team, um, in particular about the emergency access side of things. I think throughout all of this, the, the main driver has been to try and get really clear purpose um, in mind as to what the secondary access is all about. Um, and in particular, um, you've heard discussion about um, the, the permanent secondary access or what's been termed the permanent secondary access, which is a, a longer term um, access potentially to provide uh, connections through to future growth cells. Um, Waikato 2070 does identify areas to the south of Rangatahi and in Raglan West for future growth. Um, and so certainly it also identifies potential connections at a very high level, but certainly there could be um, a need for that in the future. Um, but that is, is, as I said, subject to a separate process that will need to happen and, and in particular a structure planning exercise, which um, Waikato 2070 foreshadows for growth areas. So that then uh, leaves the, the two main points of consideration for the secondary access being construction traffic and, and the emergency access um, side of it. Um, in terms of construction traffic, it has been um, 
accepted certainly by Rangatahi, as I said earlier in my introduction when I gave the context that um, all construction traffic will continue to use Bensonman Road. Um, whether the district plan addresses that or not, I suspect that that would still continue to be the outcome through a, a subdivision consent process. In fact, the operative district plan doesn't address that element of the, um, the secondary access at all, but it still has come through as um, an expected requirement through construction management plans, for instance, for the, the precincts that have been constructed to date. Um, that's, that issue is relatively straightforward. Um, but providing secondary access through the peninsula for emergency vehicles, so through as opposed to to, um, is comparatively a lot more complex. Um, in my summary statement, I'll just refer you to attachment two. Um, this has been touched on briefly around the challenges when you've got a peninsula involving construction essentially working north to south. Um, and, and a secondary access route that follows the spine road, essentially, for, for the most part. Um, the challenge of actually being able to maintain a secondary access for emergency vehicles as bulk earthworks move from north to south is, is a significant one. The photo in attachment two was taken uh, about a week or two ago, um, and it's from the end of the completed section of the spine road within precinct A looking south across uh, precinct D, which is, which is under construction at the moment. And so you'll see if there was a requirement in the district plan uh, for each stage of development that, we, that there was a need to provide uh, a secondary access for emergency vehicles um, through the peninsula, then that would be impractical to meet. Um, Dr. Clark's obviously said that he, he doesn't consider it to be necessary, but it's also, it's also impractical in my view. So where we've got to with the, um, where I've got to with my suggested drafting of the, the provisions is um, an acceptance that that can happen once the spine road has extended right to the south. That becomes a practical option to have an emergency access extending from there through to Bensonman Road, but not before then. Um, just addressing some of the comments that have already come up uh, around timing and in particular when uh, the development might be at a stage where it's reached that southern, that southern boundary. I've discussed that with Mr. Mr. McLaughlin, who's the development manager for Rangatahi, and the expectation is that the full completion of the full development is a five to ten year process from, from now. So, um, in all likelihood, the availability um, of a, an emergency access uh, is, is unable to be confirmed for, for that five to 10 year period. Of course, over that time, there's going to be less houses constructed on the peninsula as well, because titles will progressively be issued and there won't be quite as many houses um, at the outset as there will eventually when, when development is completed. Um, I think there is certainly an opportunity to refine the policy, Dr. Mitchell um, suggested. So um, a couple of things that I would consider there, maybe making it a more succinct policy. Um, so it does read less like a rule. The other is, and I haven't quite got to, to considering the detail of this, whether it could be attached to another policy um, so that it, it addressed the, the importance in particular of a construction um, interim access. Um, although, coming back to my comment earlier, I don't expect that that will be an issue regardless of whether the policy addresses it, um, that coming through at subdivision consent stage. In terms of the assessment criteria, there are certainly benefits, I think, to, to Rangatahi um, and other parties in having quite directive assessment criteria, quite specific criteria, because um, certainly one of the key issues, concerns is uh, is that the secondary access doesn't become bigger than it needs to be in, in future. And so there's a degree of certainty going forward. And so the wording of the assessment criteria at the moment, for instance, refers to the fact that the existing uh, metal track is sufficient. Um, and that would, uh, having that level of detail in there is, is uh, potentially beneficial. Um, moving on to significant natural areas. Um, and again, picking up on points that have been, that have been raised to date this morning. There certainly is a really robust um, policy framework for the Rangatahi Peninsula. It's, it's predicated on um, ecological enhancement, maintaining enhan and enhancing ecological values. 
And what I thought I might do is just bring that up and, and share it with you, um, because it certainly differs from other parts of the, the district where um, development's occurring and there's less focus on that. This has always been a key part of the structure plan. So um, I'll share my screen. Is that coming through? Yes, just just minimize that um, bump from the right all the just to make it a little bit easier to read. Zoom in a little bit too. That's better. Thank you. So, um, I've just, just this highlighted some of the key provisions relating to natural features. Um, we've got an objective 9.33. Um, which talks about natural features, including ecology, um, habitat, coastal environment being maintained and enhanced. Um, there's requirements in here for green spaces um, and providing green buffers between urban development and the coast. Uh, 9332, um, coastal strips and buffer areas shown on the structure plan being maintained with appropriately sourced locally appropriate indigenous coastal species to maintain and enhance the natural values of the coastal environment. Uh, 9335 uh, deals with early systems and stream margins, um, seeks to plant and manage those to maintain and enhance their, their values. Um, and also uh, B specifically refers to the fact that that planting is anticipated or, or is required to result in net environmental gain. So that's the enhancement um, element, obviously. And then 9337, which is the one that um, has been subject to some um, well, to evidence and some suggested changes, um, the significant ecological and habitat values of the peninsula are maintained and enhanced. Um, loss of significant indigenous vegetation and significant habitat of indigenous fauna should be avoided. And then C, uh, which is reinstating um, some of what was included in the operative plan but fell away through the proposed district plan was recognising as the structure plan does, that there are some areas, uh, in particular where roads um, do cross within areas identified in the structure plan as part of the open space, the open space framework. Um, and that in those locations, short term minor or localized degradation effects um, uh, can be mitigated or offset if they can't be practically avoided. So, um, what I take from that is, is quite strong policy framework around um, significant areas that's certainly inherent in the structure plan. Um, and to the point that if significant natural areas weren't to be included, I don't think it would ultimately uh, be to the detriment of the outcomes at Rangatahi. That, that's clear and, and uh, certainly a big driver for the, the approach through the policies as they exist at the moment. Um, we have tried to work with the fact that SNAs have come in and so um, I've proposed some amendments through that um, in discussion with Mr Nuth which focus on um, providing I guess uh, provision in there for reasonable activities to occur where they're likely to have minor effects or that they're minor in nature um, and Mr N Mr Nuth explained earlier where um, the rules have got to on that which, which we both agree on. Um, the nature of vegetation, indigenous vegetation clear, clearance, for instance, that would be permitted would be um, minor works, including things that would um, need to happen potentially at relatively uh, short notice, like removing vegetation where it poses a risk to, to, um, to human health um, and well-being. And certainly where we've got uh, walkways along coastal margins and that sort of thing, and you've got vegetation uh, within SNAs around those areas, that becomes obviously an important consideration. Um, I do think uh, where SNAs come in, it is important to have robust information. Um, as I said earlier, the only area that I've delved deeply into um, without having any ecological um, review undertaken is the Precinct A area, and that certainly shows that um, there are some areas that don't match up with current values. Um, and perhaps that was a timing issue as well, where desktop assessments were done based on old aerial photo uh, photographs, for instance, and um, but certainly doesn't reflect what's what's on the ground at the moment. And I guess similarly uh, with Precinct D, which has been consent and is under construction at the moment, there may be those sorts of issues that could arise there as well. 
Uh, precinct E is probably where the biggest conflict um, exists in terms of uh, SNAs and development. And again, I might just share my screen now so I can briefly explain that. Um, All right, I'll just try and figure out what, how I present this one. Yeah. Just bear with me. Okay, how's that? Yep, that's good, thank you. So you'll see the main conflicts with um, outside of Precinct A, which has been completed, the main conflict coming down further south uh, in Precinct E, where there are roads, for instance, that are shown coming through SNAs um, in a couple of different locations. So this area here in particular um, is an area where there's, where there's certainly some potential conflict. Working further down south, uh, it tends to start to push away from the, the structure plan locations of lots and um, to the west, the fingers that come up in here, the development precincts largely um, are away from those in any case. So this, is, this is the, um, the primary um, point of, of conflict through here. Um, I'll briefly just touch on subdivision variants in relation to the structure plan. So um, the development or subdivision has now become a restricted discretionary activity. It was controlled activity under the operative district plan. And um, I consider that that means that variance from the structure plan should be assessed through assessment criteria and policies rather than um, prescriptive variance standards. The development to date has largely reflected the structure plan and, um, and I expect that to, to continue in the foreseeable future, Precinct D, is, um, is very similar to the structure plan as well. Um, Dr. Mitchell noted a comment about the wording of um, the standard that we've that I've proposed to retain around the 10% allowable increase for each precinct. And um, that's something that I'm happy to have a further discussion with Ms. Trenuth on and, and just refine the wording a little bit. I take, take the point that um, uh, it could be clearer. Um, but that's, that's the only variant standard that I recommend remain in there and the other provisions uh, have moved through to assessment criteria. Um, so in summary, I support where um, Ms. Trenuth uh, has got to in her most recent rebuttal evidence. Um, the uh, matter of the secondary access is, is the exception and um, I've su submitted a, an alternative set there um, of provisions, um, but we're largely in agreement. Um, so yeah, thank you. Right. Thanks, Mr. Inger. Let's see how we go with any questions. Ms. Cedric? Oh, my mute wouldn't come off. I think I'm having those problems. Um, no, I have no questions uh, at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Fulton? Yeah, no, no, thanks, Mr. Inger. Thank you. Mr. Marg? No, thank you. Mr. Kearney? Um, just um, on the significant natural areas, Mr. Inga, um, Dr. Mitchell mentioned about an alternative way is to rely on the structure plan. Um, <clears throat> if we went down that, instead of having the SNAs identified, if we went down that track, um, could you just show me uh, where in the structure plan those areas are shown and what level of protection there is for them? I just want, just want to see in practice how, how, how it would work. Yeah, sure. Um, I will share my screen. Just while he's doing that, 
Mr Cooney, I wasn't necessarily suggesting that the current provisions are sufficient, but that that was an alternative mechanism that oh, okay. could be considered. Yeah. So I wasn't saying it's yeah. already addressed. I'm saying it could be addressed, yeah. at least potentially, by not referring to SNAs, but referring to what happens within certain areas within the structure plan. Yeah, and that's what I was, I was sort of proceeding to as to what, what policies, object, uh, mm -hmm. objectives and rules would, would then apply. So that's what I was really fishing for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good. So the um, objectives and policies, the key ones are the ones that I stepped you through um, yeah. earlier and, and took you through. Uh, in terms of the structure plan itself, um, the this plan in particular, this is plan three, um, which is in appendix eight of the district plan. Uh, shows uh, existing native vegetation, proposed new native vegetation, um, and also recreation reserves. So this I just get you to make that screen a bit, get rid of the, all the, yeah. there's a bit of bump on both sides. If you can sort of shrink that back a bit and maybe expand, yeah. expand the map, that just the scale so we can read it a bit more clearly, I think would be helpful. I'm not sure if I can get rid of the, the bump. That might, that's, that's better. Well, that's but, certainly that's better, better than yeah. it was. Okay, I'll, I'll scroll up so you can see the key. Um, so this plan, uh, for instance, shows the areas uh, and gives context to those objectives and policies that I talked about around ecological enhancement and where the focus of that might be. And I'll just scroll down so you can get a bit of an idea of where it sits. It does follow, um, for instance, the gully fingers that were identified um, in those SNAs. So there is, on face value, a fairly um, high degree of consistency there. You'll, you'll recall there was an SNA shown along here and it's picked up some of that. Um, so, and then similarly um, in these areas here, um, this is actually a site so that's a reserve sitting up on a, on a hill, um, but these are the gully fingers coming up and in. And, and those, areas, sense, those areas aren't subject to development per se, are they? No, so this sits outside, so there's layers with, with the structure plan maps, and so um, there's another, let me find it. You'll also see here, um, these are landscape uh, restoration areas that it identifies, for instance, the road that I spoke about earlier, where there was a conflict between the SNA that was proposed and the road coming through, it identifies and anticipates that, um, but, um, and I guess this is where the, the policy provision for minor impacts, um, where there's a need for them, um, comes in. Um, so these are the development precincts shaded in brown. Yep. All right. <clears throat> okay, so that's that's one option we've got. And the, other, the, the other is to ground truth the SNAs, isn't it? Um, um, and are you, is your client willing to do that, do you know? Um, I think Ms Parkinson may have addressed that in, um, in her legal submissions um, in the sense that uh, um, if the council was willing to, to take that task on, then certainly Rangate could provide all of the background documentation that's available for the peninsula. Obviously, this goes back some, some way, so that could all be provided um, for a ground truthing exercise, yeah. I suppose where I'm getting to is to lay the costs on you rather than, <laughs> than on the council. So, so, um, um, and and I, I take the point that I think in your evidence you said, look, you, you've got no objection to um, uh, to them being identified as long as they're properly done so, so properly identified. So, so that's where I'm sort of trying to. We can't make you, of course, but. Um, I wonder whether that's something that you might want to think about. Yeah, look, I'd be happy to raise it with um, with my client and have a chat to Ms. Parkinson as well about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Before you do, we'd we'd have to look at the this issue and then come back to you. I think. Mm. That's all I've got. Um, and I'd just like to say, um, and it's not often um, owners or slash developers. Um, um, get acknowledged, but but I, I think from my perspective, anyhow, um, this is a, a very well designed and planned uh, overall subdivision. So um, so if you can pass that on to acknowledge that from my perspective, anyhow. I will. Thank you.
Just, I, I think I've only got one question at the moment, Mr. Ringer, because I've canvassed them before. Um, the question would be that if you were to retain significant natural areas in, in the structure plan area, e.g. you were cross-referencing those which th those provisions that would apply to SNAs through the district as a whole. Why would you need all the objectives and policies that you took us through about protecting and enhancing those areas? Wouldn't the, the SNA provisions of, the, of themselves address those such that the extra provisions were redundant? It's like more belts and braces, isn't it? Don't you need to have one or the other, but not both? Yeah, look, it's certainly, certainly belts and braces. It's sort of one on top of the other. There's no doubt about that. Um, I think uh, the, the majority, uh, as I recall, of the provisions that I took you through earlier have come through from the, um, the operative district plan, so relatively unchanged and perhaps mm. even entirely unchanged. Mm. Um, so it's really a, a, a situation where there's, there's just carryover provision. Um, I would have to go through them in sort of finer grain detail to see whether there was anything over and above. Um, I guess the, the SNA level provisions, I think that they're certainly focused on, um, on avoidance and, and sort of protecting what's there, whereas the approach with Rangatahi is also about enhancement. And so right. I think to that degree, having finer grain provisions in the Rangatahi chapter makes sense still. Um, whether the avoidance type ones um, are you know, unnecessary repetition, perhaps, um, I think they certainly, they sit alongside each other okay. And, and that's been the focus of the, my evidence and the changes that I've been trying to work through is just to make sure that there's no conflict and that where the yeah. SNA provisions come in, they anticipate that there has been a comprehensive structure planning exercise for rangatahi and there are rangatahi specific provisions and they, they don't, um, you know, butt heads with them. So um, I, I'd be quite comfortable them staying in there on the basis that they do reflect a, a site specific um, approach, I guess, um, as long as there wasn't that conflict between those and the SNA provisions. Why do you need the SNA, if you take your approach, why do you need the SNA provisions at all? Uh, and I think that's the bigger question. I think if you were to retain one, the more targeted and detailed provisions for the Rangatahi chapter um, have the broader coverage and are more specific to Rangatahi. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. There's there's certainly a, a, an opportunity I think to look at uh, the SNA provisions moving away. I'd probably do that in preference to moving the Rangatahi provisions to the side. Yeah. Okay. No, that's understood. All right. I think that's um, that's clear enough. Ms. Parkinson, is there anything you want to remind us about or matters arising? Uh. I think the only point I really wanted to emphasise is in terms of the secondary access that um, there's just not the section 32 evaluation there for a permanent one and the desire and the transport team to retain it is, is not enough. Uh, and the second point is in terms of the assessment um, criteria um, and the subdivision rules, the main concern there for the submitter is to ensure certainty um, to avoid debate um, later in, in the resource consent processes. Uh, so that's really been driving some of that more prescriptive detail that's come through in those assessment criteria. Um, with the structure plan area development um, taking place over five to 10 years, um, there, there is, um, planning certainty um, going forward that that um, alternative access will be available for that period for construction traffic and certainly no suggestion from the submitter that it would um, preclude emergency traffic if it did need to come through there. Um, I, I think that that's probably something that prevails all over rural New Zealand. If, um, if, if there's a need and a, a true emergency, then um, you know farmers and, and rural landowners are willing to allow their land to be used for access. Um, it, it would be a fairly uncommunity-minded landowner who um, precluded that. So uh, 
picking up on uh, Dr. Mitchell's point of whether there needs to be a policy framework to support those methods and assessment criteria, I think that's really doubtful that it's necessary um, that the objective and policy framework for the Rangitahi Peninsula um, does have some sort of more general um, provisions in there. And, and if there was going to be a policy, I'd suggest it would be better to look at perhaps amending some of those um, policies rather than having a standalone policy. So, for example, if you needed to include avoiding um, the adverse effects of construction um, into, into that policy, into the more general policies, that seems to be a better way to go than some sort of standalone policy just for this limited purpose. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, as is our normal practice, um, we're happy to, for Ms. Trenouth to um, see whether her views have changed having heard um, from the submitter. Where have you got to, Ms. Trenouth? Uh, thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Um, having listened to the discussion, um, I guess choosing, first of all, secondary access. Um, I accept that the policy on secondary access um, is quite detailed and, and isn't necessary, provided there is assessment criteria in there. And I agree um, the points just being discussed around the need for some certainty. So I guess where these issues have, have you know, come up is, is through those subdivision and resource consent process and the people that are dealing with those not being in the room and not in, and relying on the plan for the guidance to, to make their decisions. So I think that those assessment criteria would need to be quite explicit as they are in the um, provisions proposed by Mr. Inger. Um, so I think those would be sufficient to clarify what the purpose of that guidance is. Um, sorry, the purpose of that secondary access. I would be reluctant to to remove those and I think you, you mentioned, you know, the final subdivision around the easement, couldn't that discussion be had then? And yes, I agree, theoretically it could be, but if there's nothing in the plan around what the expectations are, it kind of leaves it a little bit open. So I think it's helpful to have uh, an express list, if not in a policy in, in the um, assessment criteria. That was all I was going to say about secondary access. In terms of the significant natural areas, I've just been having a look at some of the existing structure plan um, maps that Mr. Inger mentioned. Um, plan three, which is the indicative open space framework. And I just note that the council's um, intramaps, is it? The, the mapping tool does actually have the layers of the structure plan on there, including that plan three. Um, I can share that with you if you like to show you what that looks like. Yeah, that'd be helpful, yes, please. So you should be able to see a map there with some pink on it. Yes. So that pink is so on the left here. We've got um, the Rangitahi layers. So that currently what I've got up there is the um, structure plan map, and that pink is the Rangitahi development precincts, which are referred to in the rules in terms of where development can go. The hatched areas are landscape um, restoration areas. Uh, these currently don't have um, any precinct provisions on them, but you could use that layer as the basis potentially. I think you would find that that is essentially the significant natural areas um, maps. Now, the question is in there, I think, is a combination probably of enhancement and protection. So it just um, the issue does come up around how do you deal with the NZCPS issue of avoiding um, any impacts on those avoid and threatened species in policy 11A. So there would need to be some careful consideration of how that would be dealt with. 
Um, so yeah, you would need some some specific bespoke provisions in there if you were going to remove the SNA maps and provisions. But I think it could be done, particularly given that this is, is, is a development area. So provided you had sufficient um, planning framework with you know discretionary activity sort of triggers, for example, if you were going to go through those areas to give you sufficient um, ability to consider that um, avoidance requirement of the NZCPS and perhaps um, that a stronger policy might be picked up there that might need to lead to some sort of decision at the resource consent stage of avoiding the alignment of a road if you, if you can identify at that time that there are some actual threatened species in there. We don't know whether there are, where exactly they are. Um, but essentially, you can't, um, the way that the structure plan is developed, you can't avoid going through the, the, the whole premise of the roading um, layout goes through these areas. And, and I think in one, one precinct in, in total, you, you wouldn't be able to get to if you didn't go through one of these significant natural areas. So it does really bring into question the fact that this is an approved operative plan um, plan change, which was deemed to, to give effect to the NZCPS at the time, how you manage that. And also just pointing out Mr. Inga's point about the fact that the Rangatahi provisions are much more, um, have a, a much more emphasising the enhancement um, requirement rather than the SNA approach of, of protection. In terms of the variance rule um, that you raised about the drafting of that rule, um, I just wondered whether something like, just as a, just to see if this addresses your concern about drafting, rather than the wording that was there saying something along the lines of the number of dwellings illustrated for each precinct on the neighbourhood outcomes plan in the Rangatahi structure plan, allowing for a variance of up to 10%. Whether that is more clear or whether you still think that's relying too much on the structure plan rather than the face of the vision that yeah, I, I don't think we're going to get into the detailed drafting, but that's certainly along the lines of, um, I suspect if you thought about it a bit longer, you might make it a bit shorter as well, but I don't think we'll get in. I think that's he heading in the right direction. Okay, thank you. So that's all I had to, those were the right. only comments. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Let's just see if there's any questions arising from that, and then we'll... Um, talk about a where to from here. Mr. Cooney, anything from you? Uh, no, no, thank you. Mr. Fulton? Oh, I have no questions, thank you. Ms. Sedgwick? Uh, no, I don't, but thank you very much to the submitters for your clarity. Mr. Mark? No, nothing from me, but thank you, everybody. And and there's nothing from me either. I think we're, we're at a stage where everyone's pretty clear on what's being uh, said today. It seems to me at least, and obviously the panel hasn't had a chance to consider this at all, but there's been a, a, a high degree of cooperation between the council and the submitter in terms of finessing the details to the point that there's very little left uh, to be sorted. But I think there's a general view that another iteration of the provisions would make sense. We're not afraid to make decisions, but we would prefer not to get into drafting of the sort that we've just been discussing with Ms. Trenouth when she said, well, would this be a little bit better? And I think the answer is yes, but. So we would, I think we would prefer you to continue for one more iteration around the provisions and then provide them to us for our consideration. And I don't think we'll issue any directions formally about it. Um, I think you're clear from the questions that we've asked what it is we're thinking about. You know, it is, it, and, and I, I suppose to summarize them, there's the finessing of the secondary road policy versus the rules versus the assessment criteria um, and whether there's a need for an easement or not. And I think our, 
we we wonder whether well I wonder whether that's necessary or not. And I think Ms. Trenouth said she was certain that it was needed either. So you can reflect on that, reflect on how to how to address the the ecological areas, and I'll call them ecological areas rather than SNAs, because it may be that that's the tack that you go down. And I I think what what we want to absolutely avoid is a whole lot of additional provisions at Rangatahi that then duplicate in part and then extend beyond what's already present. And, and what I mean by that is we, we don't see the need, well, I don't see the need to have belts and braces approach to every issue that says there's general provisions in the plan that address a particular issue. All of them apply as do these new provisions, which in large part duplicate what's already in another section. That's just inefficient. So I think we would encourage you to think about how site specific should the provisions be versus how much reliance there should be on the general provisions that apply elsewhere. And that particularly applies to the SNA issue. So I don't think we're, we're, we're inclined to issue any specific directions on saying, please do this or please do that. But we would encourage you to continue the conversations that you've had up until this point, take on board the questioning and the things that appear to be of interest to us and come back with a with another set of provisions that either says we're agreed that this is what they are or here's version A and version B um, where we do have some differences. And hopefully there won't be many or any of them. Does that does that sound like a set? Is the panel happy that that's the that's the approach that we take? Yes. No one objects to that. How long would it would it take to do that? Do you think? Um, just thinking. Of, I'm just. I think it would be at least a couple of weeks to sort of give. And again, obviously, Christmas is coming up. So um, I'm not sure what Mr. Inger's um, next few weeks are looking like, but um, there's not too much work in there to do. So I certainly think we could get together this week to, to discuss what we needed to focus on and um, certainly make a reasonable amount of progress before Christmas next couple of weeks. Two weeks would, would be plenty in my view. Yep, that'll be fine. I think it'd be quite good to wrap it up before Christmas, if, if possible, because otherwise it'll, yeah. if it goes beyond Christmas, nothing will be done before Christmas and then everyone will have forgotten and we'll go back to square one again. So would, fri would Friday next week be an appropriate time or do you want till Monday? I'd be happy with from Friday now? next week, um, Dr Mitchell. You would be, did you say? Yeah, yeah that'd be fine. All right. Look, and if that doesn't work, then come back to us and say we're going to, be, you know, we've we've run into a into a bit of a roadblock. Um, we need a little bit more time. We're not too bothered about that, but we would encourage you to strike while the iron's hot and get it sorted out because it doesn't appear to be anything that's unresolvable. Yes. So if we say close the play Friday week, which must be about the 18th, 18th, 5 p.m. on Friday the 18th, unless we hear from you otherwise. Yeah. Great. And I think that probably brings us to the end of today, unless there's anything from the panel or any of the parties. No, thank you. Uh, just, just on behalf of this um, submitted, just expressing um, that thanks to the panel for that very pragmatic suggestion. I think that's an excellent way forward. Thank you. And, and I think what Mr. Cooney said, I think we're pretty, on pretty safe ground to say that the, the um, comment that he made that he said that he could only speak personally, I think that does apply to all of us, even though we haven't done a straw poll. Um, I think we're very appreciative of the way that um, everybody's cooperated to get to this point. So we're grateful for that as well and happy for mm. that to be passed on. Yeah, thank you. I'll certainly do that to David Peacock. Um... Uh, Dr. Mitchell, thanks.
And I think on that basis, we'll adjourn. But if the panel wouldn't mind holding fire for a moment, we can just... Uh,